asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, and TriggerWarning.tv. I've been thinking a lot about the conversation I had yesterday with Sharon Gale. I've been thinking about it all night and all day, to be honest with you. And generally, you wouldn't be human if when you spoke with people like Sharon who have stories to tell, like the story Sharon told you and me yesterday, you wouldn't be human if it didn't stay with you and you didn't think about it. And we've had women on the programme before, and, and men sometimes as well, talking about ending up in a situation where their children were being taken, wrongfully taken, of course, by people acting on behalf of social services and local authorities. Now, Sharon's story is is incredible. I've never met anybody quite like Sharon in terms of, and I'll qualify that, somebody bringing with them a box of evidence to support what it is they're saying. When I speak to people who are going to come on the programme to to tell a story about how they have ended up on the wrong end of a terrible decision like the one she's ended up on not to mention the other things that have happened to her over the last 12 15 years 17 years but usually when people come along I speak to them and chat quite a bit to them and try and get a sense of whether what they are saying is credible or not and sometimes they'll have some evidence, sometimes they won't. But a decision will be made that they should come on anyway because they're lucid, smart people whose story adds up. But nobody has ever come along to me in my career as a presenter and as a producer and said to me, all of these th- terrible things happened to me beginning with the wrongful death of my daughter back in 2001 and the subsequent cover-up of that, the retaliation, the terrible court case where her husband, ex-husband, was accused of murdering their daughter and everything that came after that. I've never been in a position where somebody has dumped not 700 documents or 1,000 documents or 1,500 documents, but a couple of dozen documents, official documents, real documents, that back up completely what it is they're saying. Now, I was going to talk a lot about this now, but I'm not. I'm going to leave it for a bit. I'm going to talk about it a little bit later on in the programme because I've been thinking about it. And I've been thinking about what we should be doing about stories like the one we were told by Sharon Gale. Because that's a very profound, it's a very deeply personal thing to me as a producer and as a presenter. What do you do when you speak to somebody like Sharon Gale? What do you do afterwards? What do you do about what you've just heard? And I want to talk about that in some detail later. And I was going to do it now, but I'm going to do a news roundup now because I want to just leave that in your mind. And maybe later on we'll get some comment from you. What should or what can we do when a woman comes along, a lady comes along and says, look at what the medical establishment and the government and the Crown Prosecution Service, look at what they've done to me and my family, and she proves it. What do we do about it? And I want to talk about that later on. It's been on my mind overnight. It's been on my mind today. I had a brief chat with Sharon today. She saw her daughter today. She gets to see her once a month. And we had a chat about what, 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 what could be done going forward and for the moment the last thing I'll say is we have been, when I say we, I have been and I know she has been in contact with some journalists but also an old friend of mine who's a woman, I won't name her now but she's a woman who finds human interest stories and then gives them to the tabloid newspapers and she's very good at doing that. Now she's not made any promises. She's like a broker, she's a a very good journalist, very very good journalist in her own right and will find stories and bring them to the attention of the national media. Sometimes they'll pick them up and they'll run with them, and sometimes they won't. But she's undertaken a commitment to at least try to get some national media interest in what Sharon said to us yesterday. So we'll leave that for now. How about that, right? I've not even turned on. It's been one of those days. I've had a few things going on outside of the show, and 
I didn't have a lot of time to work on the show today, but I, I found time, and I've got some very interesting things to talk about now. And um, but um, it's been one of those days. I've been thinking about this all day. We'll talk about it later in the program. Me and you, we will talk about what can we do about information like this in the absence of any interest from. Well, let's hope the media will pick this story up. But in the eventuality that people turn a blind eye, the people, you know, much better place to do something about it than us, people who hold powerful positions in the media, in law and in government. When they're absent, what can you and me and our friends do about these stories? Have a think about that. Right. Um, good to be with you. Fab Radio 2 in Manchester. Trigger warning. TV, richieallen.co.uk. This is Europe's most listened to independent radio show. Thank you for joining me this Wednesday. It's exactly 10 minutes past the hour. Let's jump into the, the big story of the day and the headlines of the day. Well, Boris Johnson, the UK Foreign Secretary, well, he's a pathological liar. And he was exposed as a liar yesterday when the chief executive of the Port and Down Chemical Weapons Facility who's a man called Gary Aitkenhead, Aitkenhead said that the scientists at Port and Down haven't been able to establish where the Novichok agent originated. Now, the Novichok agent is the, the gas, the nerve agent, that was allegedly used on the Skripals, Sergei and Yulia Skripal. So this was a bombshell yesterday. Gary Aitkenhead, Port and Down, not far from Salisbury. Well, we've not been able to determine where it came from, he said. But Boris Johnson had told German television a couple of weeks ago that Port and Down had explicitly told him that it had originated in Russia. Here's Sky News' Kay Burley leading into this story, which is, I suppose, the biggest and the most talked about story of the day. Very good afternoon. The Foreign Office has admitted deleting a Twitter post on Russia's culpability over the Salisbury spy poisoning. The tweet from two weeks ago claimed UK experts had proved that the nerve agent was produced in Moscow. Let's take a look at it. It says, analysis by world-leading experts at the Defence Science and Technology Lab at Porton Down made clear that this was a military-grade Novichok nerve agent produced in Russia. Porton Down is an OPCW-accredited and designated laboratory. Right, there you go. Bombshell story, Kay Burley there. It means the government has basically been caught with its trousers down. Caught with their trousers down. They deleted this tweet that was read out very eloquently by Kay Burley. They deleted a tweet which is basically covering up the evidence because yesterday, as I mentioned a minute ago, Gary Aitkenhead, the chief executive of Port and Down, well, he had this to say to Sky News. So to be clear, you're not able at Port and Down to say where it is from? At this stage, with the work that we've done thus far, we've been able to establish that it's Novichok or from that family. Um, we are continuing to work to help to provide additional information that might help us get closer to, you know, the, the question that you asked, but, but we haven't yet been able to do that. Cut and dried. We can't say that it came from Russia. Now, Bojo the Clown, the dithering, blathering idiot currently occupying the Foreign Secretary's office, he was in no doubt about Russia's culpability and told a German television presenter two weeks ago that he personally asked Porton down and they told him that it had come from Russia. There can be no confusion about what Johnson actually said. You, you argue that uh, the source of uh, this nerve agent, Novichok, is Russia. How did you manage to find it out so quickly? Does Britain possess samples of this? People from, from Port and Down, the, the, the uh, laboratory. So they have the samples, they yeah. They do. And, they, and they, they, they were absolutely categorical. And I asked the guy, myself, I said, are you sure? And he said, there's no doubt. So... Um, I, we have very little alternative but to take the action that we have taken. Right. So that's what he said. Now, you're not the least bit surprised that Bojo and his warmongering pals at the Foreign Office lied. 
because that's their default position. You know, I was thinking today about how the Romans, God bless the Romans, used to throw corrupt public officials to the lions. Sounds good, doesn't it? Because this is no joke, this. This is not two liars or a pair of liars. It sounds like a sting, doesn't it? This is not a pair of liars just telling lies about one another. This is about people telling lies that could result in an escalation between Russia, the UK and of course everybody else then afterwards. And that's not melodrama. That's not sensationalising what we're being told. What these guys are doing is driving this country to the brink of a conflict with Russia through pathological lying. Have a listen to Sky News correspondent Alastair Bunkle. He stood next to Kay Burley today and his job is to explain to Kay what's going on. Alistair Bunkle. Well, I know why it was deleted. It was deleted because um, it was a mischaracterization of what the uh, British ambassador to... Yeah, I should have pointed out he's talking about the Foreign Office deleting the tweet that said Porton Down had told them it had, the, the, the agent had originated in Russia. They deleted that tweet when the chief executive went public yesterday and said they have not been able to prove it came from Russia. So Alistair Bunkle is telling Kay Burley why the Foreign Office deleted that tweet. Well, I know why it was deleted. It was deleted because um, it was a mischaracterization of what the uh, British ambassador to Moscow had to say in a briefing. And uh, it was done in light of Paul Kelso, our colleague's interview with the CEO of Porton Down last night. And this morning, the Foreign Office reviewed its Twitter account, found this tweet and decided to delete it. Uh, I'll first give you the official response from the Foreign Please. Office. They said, um, Her Majesty's Ambassador to Moscow briefing on the 22nd of March was tweeted in real time by the Russian, uh, British Embassy in Russia and amplified by the Foreign Office Twitter account to explain what happened in Salisbury to as wide an audience as possible. One of the tweets was truncated and did not accurately report our Ambassador's words. We have removed this tweet. None of this changes the fact that it is our assessment that Russia was responsible for this brazen and reckless act and... As the international community agrees, there is no other plausible explanation. No other country has a combination of the capability, the intent and the motive to carry out such an act. So they, um, as I said, they looked at their Twitter account. They discovered this tweet and this tweet contradicted uh, what the CEO of Porton Down uh, supposedly said yesterday uh, and indeed with the government's position. Um, but they didn't tweet it without it going unnoticed. The Russians noticed it and they have seized upon it. They've seized upon it, said Bunker. Well, of course they seized upon it. What are they going to do? Only seize upon it. Notice that Burley's mate, the Sky correspondent, doesn't mention lie, untruth, deception, serious issue for the Foreign Office. Oh no, Alistair Bunkle is there to spin a tidal wave of horse manure. Listen to what Bunkle says next. You won't believe your friggin' ears. Have a listen. So what we have is... A what we have... So he's going to lay it out now. It's very, very straightforward. All he has to do is say what we have is the Foreign Office lying like Pinocchio. Lying. Lying so pathologically the blue fairy has fucking keeled over with a heart attack. That's all he has to say. That's all he has to say. The blue fairy is fucked. They're lying so much. What does he say though? Sky News presenter, supposed to be objective, giving the facts to the audience. So what we have is uh, at a point in this story where we are still in a bit of an information war and both sides, that is Russia and chiefly the United Kingdom, um, are still jostling for position in terms of trying to control the narrative. Uh, you have an error uh, by the Foreign Office of their own making and it has created a PR mess for them. Wow. We have an information war. Both sides are jostling for position and you have an error and you have a PR mess. This is supposed to be objective journalism analysing the facts. He's a spin doctor for the government. There's no errors, just lies, filthy, 
dirty, despicable, bastarding lies from the government. Alistair Bunkel, he ain't finished. But that was rooted in the interview I've referred to with the CEO of Porton Down yesterday. And he seemed to be unclear as to whether or not Porton Down had managed or not managed to establish a link to Russia. <laughs> Liar. Listen to that again. It's important you hear this again. Listen carefully. But that was rooted in the interview I've referred to with the CEO of Porton Down yesterday. And he seemed to be unclear as to whether or not Porton Down had managed or not managed to establish a link to Russia. Liar! What a disgrace to our profession, Alistair Bunkel is, you embarrassment to journalism, because Gary Aitkenhead couldn't have been more clear in what he told Sky News Paul Kelso yesterday. So to be clear, you're not able at Porton Down to say where it is from? At this stage, with the work that we've done thus far, we've been able to establish that it's Novichok or from that family. Um, we are continuing to work to help to provide additional information that might help us get closer to, you know, the, the question that you asked, but, but we haven't yet been able to do that. Simple as that. What was unclear about that? But the spin continued on Sky News. Ben Wallace, the security minister, has given an interview today. And I think it is fair to say he has been far clearer in trying to set out the government's position. Have a listen. I think Port and Dan said that their job is to identify what it is. Uh, and they have clearly identified this as a certain strain of Novacek nerve agent. Um, but their job is not to directly attribute who did it, what, how and when. That is the job of combination of the intelligence services, the detectives who are leading the police investigation and the wider government to seek attribution when it comes to a foreign state. Port and Down identified fairly quickly the strain of nerve agent and once that's identified you remove you know, from the list of suspects, 99.9% .9 of the people. We know that the Russians designed it, and we know that the Russians were the only people to make it and stockpile it. Uh, so it very quickly eliminates uh, most of the other suspects, potentially, and then add that to Russia's form, Russia's evidence of previous assassinations, the president of Russia's view that traitors should kick the bucket, um, and the fact that we had other bits of intelligence, we can add all that up together to say that we think beyond reasonable doubt this is Russia. Well, it's clarifying two things there. Firstly, that it is not Porton Down's job to attribute blame to Russia. It is Porton Down's job to identify the nerve agent as Novichok, which they did. And also, Ben Wallace was clarifying why he believes, and the British government believes, that Russia was behind this attack. Isn't Alistair Bunkel just the pits of the world as a journalist, isn't he? Because Government Minister Ben Wallace provided no clarity whatsoever in that garbage. No clarity whatsoever. Port and Down Chief Executive Gary Aitken had said that the chemical laboratory hadn't yet determined. Hadn't yet determined because finding out where the Novichok agent came from is part of their remit. You see, the bullshit is flowing through the corridors of the BBC and Sky News today. It is a river of shit. A river of shit. Whoever interviewed Ben Wallace knew full well that part of the task given to Porton Down when they were presented with the sample was to determine where it came from. Now the spin doctors are saying, well, that actually isn't part of their remit. That's a lie. And of course, Ben Wallace conveniently ignored that Boris Johnson had said that he was personally told by Porton Down staff that the agent originated in Russia. They say he didn't. They didn't tell him that. So the Foreign Secretary is a liar, which we knew anyway. But notice that the news agencies of this country are dropping that part of the story as the day goes on. As the day goes on, it's becoming less important that one of the most senior politicians in the country has been caught with his pants down around his ankles. Lying. 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 In a bid to frame the government of another country for a poisoning that we don't even know happened. We have to take the word of the local authorities in Salisbury 
that these people were poisoned. Nobody's seen them. Nobody's heard from them. They told us six days ago that Yulia Skripal was up and running. She was responding well. She was speaking. Six fucking days. Where is she? You'd have thought she'd have been discharged by now, right? You'd have thought the Russian consular officials would have been allowed in to see her now, right? To speak with her. I'm going to take a break. When we come back, Jeremy Corbyn, the Labour leader, has been speaking about this. This is a huge story. Jeremy Corbyn in a minute. Before that, a quick break. This is Wednesday's Richie Allen Show, live on richieallen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2 and TriggerWarning.tv. I see there's plenty of tweets on it. I promise I will read the tweets as well uh, in a couple of minutes. Keep them coming in. It's at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. Best to tweet me. It's much easier for me to read the tweets. It's at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. And I will read them out as soon as we come back uh, from this very short break. The Richie Allen Show relies on your support. Go to richieallen.co.uk and set up a monthly donation today. Oh, something has gone badly wrong. <laughs> right. It's going to be one of those days, is it, when things just don't work. Uh, right. I see, I see, I see, right, Joe. Okay, yeah, yeah. Something is frozen on me there. Something is frozen. Okay, we will take a quick break. When we come back, then we'll hear from Corbin. There's a place high in the mountains of Spain, a sanctuary where souls gather from all around the globe to learn about themselves and experience powerful changes in the way we see our world. They become awakened to their gifts and their power to heal others. Become part of this ever-growing worldwide family of unique, pure energy healing practitioners. Discover how amazing you truly are. Go to www www.markbayerski.com It could just change your life forever. Introducing the H2O app, a powerful water structure and application that programs vibrational energies into water through the use of different sound frequencies. Once programmed, the use of water for drinking, cooking, bathing. Give it to your friends and colleagues or spread it around the garden. The list goes on. It's not just water that the app can be used for either. It's great for programming crystals too. The H2O app is free to download and is available on both Android and Apple platforms. For further information, go to h2oapp.online. Have you lost access to important data from a computer hard drive, mobile phone, or other storage device? Maybe you have a broken hard drive containing years of information, or a smartphone that no longer works from which you'd like the pictures, movies, and chats recovered. If you would like to recover data from any type of digital device, including desktop and laptop computers, external hard drives, cameras, smartphones, NAS, and RAID servers, then contact Data Clinic today at dataclinic.co.uk now. Join in tonight's discussion by tweeting at Richie Allen Show now. Richie Allen. Welcome back to the program. Well, it's been announced since I came on air, it's been announced that Russia's request for a new joint investigation into the poisoning of Skripal and his daughter has been voted down at the International Chemical Weapons Watchdog at The Hague. Would you believe it? Russia has quite rightly accused the UK, of course, of blocking access to its investigation because Russia is entitled to be provided with a sample. These are the OPCW rules, the Organisation for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. The UK is doing everything it can to smear Russia and exclude Russia from the investigation. Russia went to The Hague and said it's got to be a new investigation, but it was voted down 15 votes to 6, it was voted down, while 17 member states abstained. The cowards. China, Azerbaijan, Sudan, Algeria and Iran backed Russia, um, but pretty much everybody else either abstained or voted against them. Azerbaijan, Sudan, Algeria, Iran and China went along with Russia's quite reasonable request for a new joint investigation in investigation even into the poisoning it had been described as perverse by the uk government what a crock before we hear from jeremy corbyn let me read some tweets on this uh, at richie allen show welcome to the show by the way uh, hi to martin in spain hi to omari 
Omari says, good analysis, Richie. We need to put pressure on the corrupt UK government. I am now convinced this was a false flag by the government. Well, the Russian embassy in London has uh, said as much and would agree with you, Omari. No two ways about it. JP in Manchester tweets, two police officers outside his front door for six days and then they say the poison was on the front door. So the police and the fireman must have superpowers, says JP. Absolutely, JP. They couldn't make their minds up whether this was, whether the Skripals came into contact with this at the gravestone of Skripal's deceased wife, whether they came into contact with this in the shopping centre, and then they wanted us to believe that these expert assassins from Russia, from the FSB, these experts, well, they just chucked a bit on the front door. <laughs> right. Yeah. Hi to Cartoon Drunk to Moinga as well. Um, we read those tweets. Hi to Charlotte. The experts have spoken to Charlotte. That should be enough so far. But the experts have been caught telling porky pies. John Kerr says, we have an error. Good old Sky. Unbelievable bullshit of the highest order from Sky News. Disgusting. Well, it is disgusting, John. But what will people do about it? We're going to talk about this later in the programme. You have a Sky News journalist, Alastair Bunkle, spinning, spinning like a roundabout on speed for the UK government, trying to make, trying to, trying to minimise the damage of this story. This guy's supposed to be a journalist. It's a disgrace. Mwinga says, some might say information wars, but I say info wars, he says, but carry on. Uh, Sean McDonald tweets, has this revelation with the lack of evidence to Novichok, has it been forced from the Russian deadline to the UK to provide evidence uh, diffusing the World War III rhetoric, says Sean McDonald. That's an interesting angle, that. Has, have calmer heads revealed the lies in order to, to quieten things down a bit? That's a very good question. Calmer heads working maybe alongside people like Boris Johnson, but trying to do something good. I don't know. Faisal tweets, the only clear evidence I can see is that the British authorities have abducted a Russian citizen and his daughter and are keeping them incommunicado against international law. And they've made up charges against Russia to cover all of that up. That's from Faisal. Cartoon Drunk says, no one knows for sure whether the event even happened. No pictures of the couple in their hospital beds like the pictures were published of the other Russian spy, Litvinenko. That's a very good point. They would have loved the propaganda benefits of photographs of the Skripals. Why didn't we see any photographs? Excellent point. Wow. Jeremy Corbyn then must feel somewhat vindicated. I mean, Corbyn was accused of being a commie bastard after Corbyn said at the very beginning, well, let's just wait till all the evidence is in, eh? Eh? Now, you know I'm no fan of Corbyn. I I detest him as much as I detest any of the rest of them. I have to say that because you get new listeners all the time. Don't be painting me as a liberal, a socialist or as a conservative. I'm neither. None of the above. Corbyn, God love him. They tried to paint him. The BBC had that Newsnight episode where they superimposed Corbyn's face against uh, Red Square in Russia. I'm laughing because it's just, it's just, it's in plain sight for people. And they doctored Corbyn's hat to make him look like a Rusky, right? Does Corbyn feel vindicated with the revelations that, well, Boris Johnson, liar, liar, pants on fire, here's Corbyn. He claimed categorically, and I think he used the words 101% that it had come from Russia, Port and Down have not said that. They've said that they've identified it as Novichok. They cannot identify the source of it. And so either the Foreign Secretary has information that he's not sharing with Port and Down, or it was a bit of exaggeration. I don't know which it is, but I think we need a responsible, cool approach to this. We need to get to the source of this to prevent it ever happening again. Right. Fair play to Corbyn. If I was Corbyn, I would have done a bit of nah, 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 nah. I would have done a bit more than that. I would have demanded the imminent resignation of Boris Johnson. I would have demanded that the investigators at Porton Down recuse themselves and that from a from a if there is such a thing, from a properly neutral country, we bring in biochemists 
to properly have a look at this. Not from a NATO country, not from an EU country, but from somewhere like Trinidad or God knows where. Bring somebody in, biochemist, and say, listen, just tell the truth. We're going to get out of your way, investigate this and get back to us, right? And I'll tell you what, you can have as much time as you want. That's what Corbyn should say. Johnson and May should resign. Because they are warmongering criminals, murderers. We knew that anyway. But they've been caught out now in heinous, egregious lies. So they should go. Right? Right. I would have said so. Jeremy Corbyn, we heard from there. So what did Boris Johnson do? Was he shamefaced in the wake of what Corbyn said? No. Johnson, the brazen bastard, accused Corbyn of siding with the Russian spin machine. Ah, you can't make this up. Johnson said it was lamentable that Corbyn was trying to discredit the UK over the incident. I didn't hear Corbyn trying to discredit the UK. I just heard Corbyn tell the truth. You, you crazy-haired buffoon fucker, you told us all that you had personally spoken with Port and Down officials and that they had assured you categorically that the agent originated in Russia. You lying little toad. Now you've been caught. See, Corbyn didn't even say that. Much more diplomatic with Corbyn. Marcus Papadopoulos is the editor of Politics First. I like Marcus. I like him. I never heard of him till today. But he was on Sky News with Marcus. He was also on the BBC as well. And Marcus Papadopoulos is bloody well annoyed at the carry-on of the UK government and the UK's press corps. This is good stuff. Marcus Papadopoulos, editor of Politics First. Well, I'm not going to be swayed by what either London or Moscow says on the tragic events of Salisbury. But it is abundantly clear that the British government's case against Russia has been severely weakened by its own scientists. Because yesterday, British scientists said they are unable to say where this Novichok came from. But that was never their job. Mr. Papadopoulos. Well, no, that is, a, that, is, that is a crucial element in the British government's case against Russia. Quite right. You heard the Sky News presenter interjecting again with the lie that it was never their job and the lying bastards are going to spin this lie for the next 36 hours. We're really sorry that the chief executive of Port and Down said they haven't yet determined the agent came from Russia. But see, that's not their job. But it is their job. It is part of their remit, officially. You can find it with a cursory search of the old tinternet. Just do a bit of tinternetting. It is part of their remit. And Aitken Head said himself, we haven't yet been able to tie down where it originated, but obviously they're investigating it. What a load of spin this is, right? Because we know that uh, the Soviet Union, modern day Russia, is not the only country in the world to have produced Novichok. Now, weeks ago, Theresa May and Boris Johnson stood before the House of Commons, stood before the British public, stood before the rest of the world and said that Russia was responsible. They now, they did that without any concrete evidence. Indeed, they did that well, without, they did that without any, any evidence without that any a legitimate or proper court of law would accept in without the any without any concrete evidence that we, me and you, members of the public, have seen, there was the OP, there was the Porton Down test to identify what it was. There are three other strands, including MI6, police investigations, and historical evidence that the British government has as well, that have not been released to the public. And that is what Theresa May said her decision was based on, not solely what Porton Down have come up with. Well, then we have a right to know what this evidence is. After all, there is a very serious standoff in the world between Britain and Russia. And if the British government is absolutely categorically sure that the Russian state was responsible for the heinous act in Salisbury, then it needs to produce the evidence. It is simply not good enough to say that Russia, quote, is most likely to have done that. You heard the Sky News presenter. This is modern day journalism. The Sky News presenter is defending the government's right not to share evidence with the general public. Um, we, we, we haven't shown you any concrete evidence that the Russians did it, but um, we have evidence that we can't show you. All right, fair enough then, yeah. Launch the missiles, start the war, we'll believe you. Because you've always told us the truth in the past, haven't you? 
haven't you? Imagine, imagine, imagine a world where journalists don't ask for information. Imagine a world where a journalist defends a scenario where a government can drive a country to the brink of a war with evidence that, well, we just can't show you. Marvellous. What a world. What a world. Imagine we translated that to everyday life. Officer, that guy there across the street, it was him that broke into my house yesterday. Any evidence? No, I can't show I have, but I can't show it to you. No problems. I'll arrest him anyway. Plenty of evidence, officer, but at this time, I can't share it with you. Great. Papadopoulos then said, and I like this, to Sky, this is Marcus Papadopoulos, the editor of Politics First, he said his sources are telling him that the French and the Germans are well pissed off in light of this new information. Pissed off for believing the UK and kicking out a few diplomats. Papadopoulos. And I have heard that uh, the Germans and the French are now saying to the British privately, of course not publicly, that um, they expelled those diplomats on the basis that the British government was certain that this Novichok came from Russia. So I don't think Paris or Berlin are at all uh, happy with this recent development. But let me just say this as well, that within hours of this tragic event in Salisbury, the British government and British mainstream media knew that the Russian state was responsible. Well, that's completely unacceptable. The argument was, un was untenable from day one. What I expected was there to have been uh, an impartial investigation carried out by the British government, a full investigation, a thorough investigation, the OPCWR cooperating, now carrying cooperating out that with the Russians. But alas, that is not what the British did. So Theresa May and Boris Johnson do have a lot to answer for. Please, Just finally, please. They stood before the British Parliament and said that Russia did it. Now British scientists are saying they don't know where this Novichok came from. Boris Johnson said only a couple of weeks ago that he was certain that the Novichok came from Russia. Dr. Papadopoulos, there are, there are indeed questions to answer. There is now Very an OPCW independent. There is, there is now an OPCW investigation independently going on, though, isn't there? Which, should we wait till the conclusion of that before we now jump to conclusions on the other side of things? Yes, and Papadopoulos said, of course we should wait for the conclusion of the investigation before we jump to any conclusions. What you just heard there was a presenter having his arse handed to him, humiliated. Basically, Papadopoulos said to the Sky News presenter, who said it's okay that the government can tell us to believe them, that the Russians did it, but we can't show you the evidence. Basically, Papadopoulos said to the Sky News guy, you, the media, went along with the Russia blaming, which started only hours after these people collapsed. 18 minutes to the top of the hour, but the media is dreadful. It's horrendous. It's horrendous. Do you think you think it can't get any worse? And then you may have heard of a woman called Dawn Butler. Now Dawn is Labour's Shadow Women and Equality Secretary. Basically, again, to remind our listeners overseas, every government secretary, every government minister has a shadow minister in the opposition party. And Dawn Butler shadows the equalities, the, the women and equality secretary. She's a Labour. MP. She was on with Adam Bolton, one of Murdoch's stalwarts, one of Sky News' most veteran presenters. Now, Bolton asks Butler, you'll hear the question, about the news that Porton Down had said they couldn't say for sure that the Novichok came from Russia. Have a listen to the conduct of Adam Bolton. Finally, um, we've had uh, this uh, comment from Porton Down that they can't absolutely confirm uh, that the uh, Novichok came from Russia. Do you yourself have any doubts that Russia was responsible for the Skripal poisonings? Well, I'm not privy to uh, those high-level briefings uh, that the Prime Minister has. I'm not privy to any of that. It's... I think that Boris Johnson has gone too far um, in what he has said. I think the Prime Minister has been a bit more measured and I think Jeremy Corbyn has been measured. And what we have to do is get to the facts and the truth of the matter. It's a very serious 
uh, issue that has happened in our country in terms of somebody being poisoned. Um, and what we have to do is deal with it uh, in a measured way. And that's what's important. It looks like Russia, though, doesn't it? Oh, what a smarmy little bastard Bolton is. Huh? Looks like Russia, though, doesn't it? And, of course, Dawn Butler, if she had a backbone, would come back now with, you're having a laugh at him, right? You've just done a news story that showed the Foreign Office has been deleting tweets because they were done up like a kipper by the chief executive of Port and Down. Adam, are you really saying to me now, it looks like Russia, doesn't it? Really, Adam? I'd have ripped him a new one if I was Dawn Butler. But Dawn has got, well... She's not got much of a backbone. Well, well, she does laugh, to be fair. I'll give her that much. Well, as I say, Adam, I'm not privileged to all of that information. Uh, at the moment, uh, we have been told that the indication is that it looks like Russia. That's what we have been told. That's the information that we have been given. But the... You know, good governance is that you need to look at the facts before you and you have to take appropriate and proportionate measures to deal with that. You know, this is a crime of a very serious nature in terms of national security and it has to be dealt with properly. And I think that that's what the government has to do and the government has to come back to Parliament and has to inform us of any latest developments and has to tell us what's happening and what measures the government's taking in order to deal with it. And that's what's important. Thank you very much indeed, Dawn Butler there late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, final word on this for now, because we've given a lot of time. I didn't mean to give it as much time, but it's so important. I hope you appreciate that, and I hope you weren't falling asleep there in the last few minutes. Final word to former Mayor of London, Ken Livingston. Now, do me a favour. I genuinely need your help here. This is not a joke. There's no gag, there's no punchline. I need your help. Ken Livingston, the former Mayor of London, who's had his own battles of late, of course, with anti-Semitism and all that garbage. Ken spoke to RT about this story, and he says something very bizarre to them about Porton Down and about an employee of Porton Down having gone to prison for illegally selling chemical weapons. At least that's what I think Ken says. And I've searched high and low on the internet and I can't find any such story. Listen to Ken Livingston. Listen carefully to what Ken tells RT. Well, they clearly don't want an open and honest investigation because the British government has set out to blame all of this on um, President Putin and Russia from the very beginning. And what is bizarre about this is all the evidence that's coming out brings us into question. It's not just that this is a chemical that could be made in many other places. We've just recently discovered that someone who worked on the site about 15 years ago was sent to prison for selling it illegally. So the idea that, you know... What did he say there, Ken? He said that somebody working on the site went to prison for selling it illegally. Does he mean Porton Down? Or does he mean somebody working out of a chemical weapons laboratory in Russia? He must mean Russia, but I can't find... And I am, you know, I'm pretty accustomed to looking for stuff on the internet. I can't find an example of somebody going to prison for selling a chemical agent, that person having worked at a chemical weapons facility. Listen to what Ken says again. Listen carefully and tell me, what do you, what do you make of this? Any other places, we've just recently discovered that someone who worked on the site about 15 years ago was sent to prison for selling it illegally. So the He must mean Russia, right? I mean, what... Let's listen to what's said leading up to it. From the very beginning. And what is bizarre about this is all the evidence that's coming out brings us into question. It's not just that this is a chemical that could be made in many other places. We've just recently discovered that someone who worked on the site about 15 years ago was sent to prison for selling it illegally. So the idea that you know, it can only be Russia behind all this is nonsense. Right, it is nonsense that only Russia can be behind it. That's nonsense. We know that there was a book on sale, I wrote about this, and many other people wrote about it. There was an Amazon.com 
there, there was a book for sale on Amazon.com written by somebody who had worked in one of these biological chemical research facilities in Russia. And he'd put the, in the book, this is not a lie, in the book was the basic steps and instructions to make Novichok. Because it's easy to make, apparently. And the c- compounds that go into making it can be found anywhere. But Ken said, and I still don't know if somebody ran out of a lab in Russia with it and sold it and was then subsequently arrested and put in prison. I can't figure that out. Last time I'm going to play this. Made in many other places. We've just recently discovered that someone who worked on the site about 15 years ago was sent to prison for selling it illegally. So the idea that, you know, it can only... You've got to help me out there. I can't find any evidence of anybody going to prison for selling a chemical agent illegally. Somebody who'd worked around or in one of these facilities, whether that was in Salisbury or whether that was in Russia. Answers on a postcard as to what Ken Livingston meant. I tried to get in touch with him later this afternoon. I've tried to get in touch with Ken Livingston before. I think Ken Livingston is aware of this radio programme going back many years to Spain. I don't think he likes this radio programme very much. That's his right. I don't think he likes me very much. That's his absolute right. So maybe I won't be hearing from him. So what the hell is he talking about? Cartoon Drunk says it has to be Russia. Well, effectively. Uh, because security is very strict at places like Port and Down. How could somebody illegally sell this without state approval? That's a very good point. I don't know. I want to know, though. Find out, guys, will you? Guys and gals, guys and gals. It's uh, exactly nine minutes to the top of the air. We're going to change tack. Got a couple of funny stories for you when we come back. We'll lighten the mood a little bit when we come back. Some humorous uh, news this Wednesday. It's me and you today. It's uh, Wednesday's Richie Allen Show, live on April 4th. It is 50 years since Martin Luther King was assassinated in Memphis. Does that mean anything to you? I'd like to hear from you if it does. Um, I've read a bit over the years, quite a bit about Dr. Martin Luther King and his 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 life story, how he came to lead civil rights uh, campaigns in, in America, the amazing things he achieved, his personal life. I've learned a lot about him. Does it mean anything to you that, um, you know, his legacy, um, if you're black, maybe it does. If Maybe you don't have to be black for the legacy of Martin Luther King to mean something to you. I would like to know, do tweet me. It's at Richie Allen Show. That's at Richie Allen Show. It is 50 years, isn't it? 50 years, it is indeed. Right, eight minutes to the top of the hour. Another very quick break. Back in a minute and we'll, we'll change. We'll change the mood. We'll bring the house lights down. Uh, one or two amusing stories that caught my eye today. Have you lost access to important data from a computer hard drive, mobile phone, or other storage device? Maybe you have a broken hard drive containing years of information, or a smartphone that no longer works from which you'd like the pictures, movies, and chats recovered. If you would like to recover data from any type of digital device, including desktop and laptop computers, external hard drives, cameras, smartphones, NAS, and RAID servers, then contact Data Clinic today at dataclinic.co.uk now. Introducing the H2O app, a powerful water structure and application that programs vibrational energies into water through the use of different sound frequencies. Once programmed, the use of water for drinking, cooking, bathing. Give it to your friends and colleagues or spread it around the garden. The list goes on. It's not just water that the app can be used for either. It's great for programming crystals too. The H2O app is free to download and is available on both Android and Apple platforms. For further information, go to h2oapp.online. There's a place high in the mountains of Spain, a sanctuary where souls gather from all around the globe to learn about themselves and experience powerful changes in the way we see our world. They become awakened to their gifts and their power to heal others. Become part of this ever-growing worldwide family of unique, pure energy healing practitioners. Discover how amazing you truly are. Go to www www.markbayerski.com It could just change your life forever. The Richie Allen Show relies on your support. Go to richieallen.co.uk and set up a monthly donation today. 
Welcome back to the programme. Nobody seems to know. Um, Moinga found a story going back um, some time ago in the Daily Mail. And it's about uh, prosecutions or possible prosecutions about claims that ex-servicemen were duped into taking part in chemical and germ warfare uh, tests. That's not what I'm looking for, Moinga, but thanks for sending it to me because it's a very salient point. Porton Down has a terrible, terrible dark history and it hasn't been covered up or hidden. It's all there. A terrible history of experimenting on people, including the civilian population, without their knowledge or their consent. No doubt about it. You see, we're, we're struggling to find what Ken Livingston was talking about, aren't we? Because it's massively important if somebody in the past was, well, fired and then jailed for taking chemical agents out of port and down. Well, we'd like to know about that, wouldn't we? All things being considered. Right? This is your Richie Allen show, by the way, he says, badly. Thanks for joining the programme. And a massive thanks on behalf of Sharon Gale, who told me today that she was very touched by some of the kind messages sent to her through Facebook and some of the comments that she's seen on the YouTube video. If you missed that yesterday, look, I tried to avoid melodrama. I I've not been involved. Now, that's not to say that the stories told to me by Emma Ibbitson, by Yolanda and Leonardo and by the other men and women who've come on here, they're not any less important, you know, than what happened to Sharon Gale. They're not any less important. They're equally as important and equally as shattering in terms of their revelations. This story, though, Sharon's one, you'll never hear anything like this. You'll never see, and I won't ever again as a journalist, when a woman, a lady, rocks up and says, this happened to me, and by the way, here's all the evidence. And I want to talk about that in a few minutes' time. And I want to talk about what we can do about things like that. What should we do? Um, what's possible and what isn't possible? Okay. A couple of interesting stories. They're interesting because <laughs> they're kind of related to things that you and I have uh, talked about in the past. This is a story coming out of Prestatin. Bastion Road in Prestatin. A man has appeared in court today on a race hate charge after a woman complained about a gollywog doll in his window. The man's name is Jason Wakefield Jones. Jones in Prestatin never. Yeah. Anyway, he's accused of intending to cause harassment, alarm or distress and that the offence was racially aggravated. And he's been at Clandidnew Magistrates Court. I know I've got Welsh listeners. I completely bollocksed that up, didn't I? Clandidnu. Did I say that right? Clandidnu. Clandidnu. I think I said it right. So he was at Clandidnu Magistrates Court and he denied the charge against him and he was bailed before a trial next month. Imagine taxpayers in Wales. This is, <laughs> this is what you're tax dollars your tax pounds are going to pay for. A guy's been sued for having a gollywog doll in his window. Now the court heard that the alleged incident took place on the 4th of January. The defending solicitor. Imagine the madness of the world when you realise that you've got to go and employ a solicitor because somebody has complained you for racism because you had a gollywog doll that happened to be on a windowsill inside your property. Right. So the defending solicitor, Roger Thomas, Thomas in Wales, Thomas said the item was a toy in a first floor window and only one person had complained. The complainant's name given in court was Sally Harland. Sally. <laughs> the BBC writes, The Gollywog is a fictional character created by Florence Kate Upton that appeared in children's books in the late 19th century, usually depicted as a type of rag doll. The gollywog has become controversial for its perceived racist connotations. Yeah. I appeal to my black brethren and sistren 
who listen to the program, please tell me why the gollywog is racist. I've never understood this. This has come up on programs over the years, the gollywog is racist. There was a gollywog in my house when I was a young boy. I don't remember. It wasn't mine, whether it was my sister's or my brother's. It was, it was part of a collection of toys. The gollywog. I know the word wog has been used against um, black folks by idiots, by dickheads uh, over the years as a slur. I understand that much. But is the doll itself racist? Why is it racist? Why would there be a perception of the doll being racist? I remember years ago, I was doing a radio program and it was the first time I'd ever heard of blackface. The idea that if you used makeup or if you used uh, oil to darken your skin to play or to represent a notable character from history, a black uh, man or woman from history, that you were you were somehow racist. And I, re- I remember, this is a true story, I did work many years ago with a screaming progressive who wasn't black, of course, it was a white woman and she was um, kind of a female version of Owen Jones. She was an arsehole, effectively. And we, we were doing a show for Talk Radio Europe years ago and I said, you know... I was I was never much of a basketball player, even though I'm very tall, but I, I always loved watching people like Scotty Pippen play for the Bulls, Jordan, of course, Carl Malone play for the Utah Jazz, even though John Stockton, the uh, I'm trying to act like I know stuff now by naming these people, dropping these names. But no, I was a big fan of the Utah Jazz and John Stockton, of course, from Spokane in Washington. John would be white. And I said to this woman, I said, well, look, if I was going to play... Carl Malone or even Magic Johnson at a fancy dress party surely to Jesus I'd have to darken my skin wouldn't I because I'm whiter than Casper the Friendly Ghost and of course you get the usual reaction don't you yeah that's the progressive scream we've never really gotten into the whole blackface thing how can it be racist if I darken my skin to play I don't know. To play Dr. Martin Luther King. If I felt like going out uh, to a fancy dress party and I wanted to learn a few words said by the great Dr. King and I wanted to look like him, I'd have to darken my skin colour, wouldn't I? It's a minute past the hour. Speaking of this progressive madness, Oxford University, what a scandal this is. (laughs) You're not going to believe it. Oxford University... A department of the university sent out invitations encouraging alumni to bring partners and wives to a dinner and they have been accused of sexism for doing that very thing. So this is an Oxford University department. They're inviting alumni to come to a do and on the invitation it said bring partners and wives. So it's obviously a mistake, right? Uh, wives, husbands, or husbands, wives, and partners. They just made a mistake, right? But they've been accused of sexism. Former Department of Materials student Dr. Anna Plosiaski, she received the reunion invite and she tweeted it using the widespread hashtag everyday sexism. Hashtag. She wrote, mm, at Oxford Materials, in which universe is it acceptable to say Partners and wives are very welcome on an invitation. Hashtag everyday sexism. Is it sexism or a clerical error? Not to be outdone, Dr. Zoe Davis. Bring along the little lady. The poor dear won't understand any of the long words, but she can sit and smile politely. Is it the end of the world that they forgot to put husbands on on the cards? Are we entering... Are we really entering a universal world of paradigm where you can be annihilated because of a simple oversight? When you're not given a chance to say, shit, we meant to put husbands as well. We're sorry if you're offended, like. Is it the end of the world? You know, I was thinking today, do you know what these progressives are driving me to? Me, person, and I can only speak for me. Do you know what they're driving me to? They're driving me to wish that I was born years ago, you know? I wish I was born back in the 30s. When women knew their place, you know. When you could say to a woman, 
Where's me dinner? That's, that's how the Irish would say it. Where's me dinner? Listen, get me slippers, will you? Listen, I'm going down the pub. Clean this place up when I'm gone, will you? I'll be back whenever I feel like it. God be with the days, eh? Gary Cooper and John Wayne and and the great actors of the day, Jimmy Stewart. I'd love to go back to those days. This is what they're driving us to, these snowflakes. I might try that with the future Mrs. Allen. I was thinking I might try a bit of it. I might even try a bit of it now and see how I get on. Caroline, do me a favour, love. Go down the off licence and get me a few cans for after the show and do us a favour. Clean up this fucking pigsty, will you? Richie, I told you to shut up with that sexy shit. And that's about the end of that. This is the Richie Allen Show live on Wednesday, the 4th of April, 2018. My name is Richie Allen. And listening to that <laughs> and reading those stories today, I was reminded of a clip from the old Harry Enfield comedy show from the BBC many years ago. Mr. Cholmondley Warner. Have a listen to this. This kind of puts it into perspective what we were hearing today. An ordinary dinner party. The sort of occasion we all enjoy. The men are exchanging witty stories. And look at the women. Aren't they pretty? Look at the way they laugh. They're delightful. But now the conversation turns to more serious matters. I wonder if the government should return to the gold standard. I think it should. Good. Then we're all agreed. But, oh dear, what's this? One of the women is about to embarrass us all. I think the government should stay off the gold standard so that the pound can reach a level that will keep our exports competitive. The lady has foolishly attempted to join the conversation with a wild and dangerous opinion of her own. What half-baked drivel. See how the men look at her with utter contempt. If they were going home. <gasps> Women, know your limits. <laughs> now let's see the proper way. Good. So we're all agreed. We should return to the gold standard. <laughs> I don't know anything about the gold standard, I'm afraid, but I do love little kittens. They're so soft and furry. What a delightful thought, you dear, sweet, fragile little thing. <laughs> Women, know your limits. In thought, be plain and simple, and let your natural sweetness shine through. <laughs> The Richie Allen Show relies on your support. Go to richieallen.co.uk and set up a monthly donation today. Welcome back to the programme. Six and a half minutes past the year. That was a classic that Harry Enfield. I can't remember what year that was, but it was very funny. Tell you what we do uh, before. Uh, we, we, I'm going to have a chat about not so much what Sharon Gale told me last night, but I want to talk about what we should do with information like that. And... We'll do that in a minute. Before we do that, though, um, we will go to Feature Story News, FSN in DC. Um, we'll get the latest headlines from them. There is a development in the Facebook Cambridge Analytica story, and I'll bring that to you in a minute. If uh, FSN doesn't do that, have a listen. From Feature Story News in London, I'm Catherine Drew. China has announced a tit for tat retaliation against President Trump's decision to impose tariffs on imports worth 50 billion US dollars. It sent global stock markets tumbling over fears of a widening trade war. Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg has agreed to testify before US lawmakers next week following concern about the company's use and protection of user data. And events are taking place around the world to mark the 50th anniversary of the assassination of US civil rights leader. Martin Luther King. Welcome back to the most listened to independent radio show in Europe. It's your Richie Allen Show. Do tweet the program between now and uh, the top of the year. It's at Richie Allen Show on Twitter, at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. Right, you know what we're going to do? Um, I've not had any uh, music. I need to grab some water. Uh, I've got some water here, but I need to have a bit of a drink of it. So before uh, we reflect on what we heard yesterday and what indeed we should be doing with information like that, which is something we don't often talk about, 
Just to give you that Facebook story, I did mention it just before the uh, music there. I said there was uh, an update. The BBC are reporting in the last three minutes that Facebook has said that it now believes that up to 87 million people's data was improperly shared with the political consultancy Cambridge Analytica. And the BBC is claiming, interestingly enough, that about one million of these users are based in the UK. This guy, Christopher Wiley, this so-called whistleblower with the pink hair, uh, he had previously said 50 million. But now Facebook are saying it's 87 million. So this story is going to explode again in the next 24 hours. And all manner of claims will be made by remoners, those who don't want the UK to leave the European Union, and uh, those who want Trump impeached for colluding with Russia, even though the detestable Donald Trump, it must be said, um, didn't collude with Russia. Russia had nothing to do with the US election or swinging it in the favour of Donald Trump. So that story is going to get a lot of time tomorrow, I would say. 87 million people's data improperly shared with Cambridge Analytica, according to Facebook, this evening. It had previously said, well, Christopher Wiley, the whistleblower with the pink hair, he said it was 50 million, right? So that's the uh, the big story. Right. I'm going to do my best with this. I've prepared nothing. I don't believe in writing stuff down. Sharon Gale was on the programme yesterday. The interview is now on several platforms, iTunes, YouTube, thanks to Simon. It's on Podomatic, of course. Um, it's on richieallen.co.uk. If you go to richieallen.co.uk, my conversation with Sharon Gale is there. An astonishing woman, um, Sharon. I'm going to very, very, very quickly synopsize the story, not doing any justice to it at all, but I'll synopsize it. Back in 2001, she had a 10-week-old daughter, Charlotte, with her then-husband, Mark, Mark Latta. And not to put too fine a point on it, she was given a series of vaccines against the knowledge of the parents. And we can't say for sure, we can't say for sure, I can't say for sure, that the vaccines were responsible for the child becoming grievously ill. But you'd have to suspect that the vaccines played some part in it because of what happened next. Within hours of getting these vaccines in, I think, October, I think, of 2001, September, October, the child became terribly ill and was rushed into hospital, was kept there, was discharged, was brought back in, was kept, was discharged. The condition was getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And it was obvious to everybody that the child was deteriorating. But for some reason, they kept discharging her. One afternoon, shortly after she'd been discharged again, her condition became worse. The, the dad had been feeding her. And the condition became, her condition became terrible and she was rushed back into hospital. This was in Winchester, and she was subsequently then sent on from Winchester to Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital, which is very famous, obviously, very famous hospital near Camden. Before she was sent to Winchester, the, the consultant paediatrician who'd been looking after her was overheard panic, panicking and swearing that somebody was going to fucking lose their job over, possibly over, he was talking about mistakes to do with baby Charlotte. Well, the police turned up. This shocked the parents. The Sharon was interviewed. Her then-husband, Mark, was interviewed. Some of the tactics used by the police were disgraceful. They even told her husband, Mark, that he wasn't the paternal father. That They tried to insinuate that Sharon had been sleeping around. Bastards. After a little while or a while, they said to Sharon, well, we don't think you had any involvement and they let her go home. But they tried to fit Mark up for the murder of his child, even though there was no evidence to suggest that he had done the baby any harm. There was a trial that was stopped and it was restarted and stopped and started again. And eventually the judge said that Mark had no case to answer and he was acquitted and he was discharged. 
And afterwards, despite the fact that they had no criminal record, they didn't harm the daughter, they were targeted by social services. And people came after them and said, well, because they had children, because Sharon had a son from another relationship, because Mark had a child from a previous relationship, they were told effectively the family couldn't stay together. They were targeted and harassed, despite the fact there was no evidence that they had ever harmed, that Mark had ever harmed Charlotte. He didn't. It's very important here. He didn't. Lies were told about fractures at the court case. There were no fractures. Nurses handled baby Charlotte at Great Ormond Street Hospital. They, they, they fell in love with her like any medical staff would do with a young baby that's struggling. She was fine to be touched. She wasn't tender. She wasn't sore. There was nothing wrong with her. At least there was nothing that you could see physically wrong with her. But her internal organs were shutting down. Right? Anyway, all of this is on YouTube. Sharon uncovered in the in the following years. First of all, she couldn't get a death cert. These, these heathens laughed and obstructed and obfuscated and they couldn't get a death certificate, which is unprecedented. It's also unprecedented. Once Mark had been acquitted in 2004, there should have been an immediate inquest called. An immediate. The national coroner should have called an inquest. Well, we can't have an unexplained death of a baby. So there would have been an inquest. None of this happened. No death cert. And then years later, they found out that there was perjury. That the man who said he had done the autopsy, the pathologist, the only guy to do the autopsy on uh, baby Charlotte, all of a sudden there was a new guy in the picture who said that he in fact had done the autopsy all of this, she's all the documentation to prove all of this. It's disgraceful. Anyway, the relationship ended. Who could survive that, you would say? And her demand for answers as to what happened to Charlotte led to her being targeted and harassed by local authority, people, by police, officers. And she was effectively hounded out of the country and left the country. She worked in the Far East and she was in Bahrain, she was in Turkey. She met a man and she never stopped asking for, quest asking for information about Charlotte, by the way. She met a man, um, she had a relationship with him and she had a baby girl, who of course we won't be naming. She thought it was okay to come back into the country and in 2013 she came back into the country. And she said to us yesterday, she put her name on the electoral roll, she thinks that was significant because last year she started getting harassed by social services again. And back in August of last year, her child was taken away from her for risk of future emotional harm. Not because there's anything wrong with the girl, not because the girl was in any danger, but because of your stance against this or your opinions on this and that and the other thing, you present a risk of future harm to your daughter. Her daughter was taken. She told us that story last night. She was amazing. She was incredibly articulate. You know, like these women have been, you know, when you think back to the great women, Emma Ibbotson, who wrote, uh, well, produced, I should say, with, uh, with the lovely Pete Middleton produced the brilliant traffic films about forced adoption. Um, like Leon and Yolanda and everybody else who's ever come on the programme, you know, we, we, we had, we've had grandmothers on the programme, you know, we had Luke Maguire on the programme and uh, we had that lovely Welsh grandmother who I really enjoyed listening to. Um, Forgive me, her name escapes me now. It'll come to me in a minute. Incredibly articulate people, decent people, telling us this story. And you know, as I was listening to Sharon last night, um, and I've, I've mentioned him before on the programme, as I was listening to her, I was profoundly sad, not just because of what she was telling me, because she'd already told me the information on Thursday, but I was desperately, horribly sad at the fact that she was telling it to me and she wasn't telling it to somebody working out of the BBC or or Sky or, or RTE. And of course I got to thinking about 
a very old friend of mine, the great, the late great Jerry Ryan. Who's the greatest talk radio presenter that's ever lived? And when Jerry Ryan was on the air many years ago on 2FM, one of Ireland's national stations, and he was the most listened to mid-morning radio presenter in the country for years and years. And he used to have people like Sharon ringing him up. And, and sometimes they would have stories of heinous corruption. Sometimes they would tell him stories that portrayed the state in a terrible light. And he would listen to them. And they would get all the airtime they needed to tell him the story. But while he was doing that, because of his prominence, because of his status, and whatever some people said about him, because when you get to that level of success, you'll always have people who don't like you. But even his detractors, when they said, oh, he was up his own arse and he had a big ego, he didn't. Everybody who stands or sits behind a microphone has an ego of sorts. But this guy wasn't in it to to advance himself to put himself out there as some sort of some sort of saint, some sort of hero, some sort of champion of the masses. But he became a champion of people who had nowhere else to go. Nobody's listening to me. I'm getting hammered by my own government, by my own local authority, by the council. We used to call it the corporation years ago. Ironically, when you think about it, we used to call the local authority the corporation. And he would listen to them. And while he was listening to them, his researchers, who were brilliantly talented men and women, would be raising politicians, raising ministers, and demanding answers. This is incredible. When I tell people about this, they don't believe it. Because I talk to a lot of people who have no recollection of this type of journalism. They don't remember it. That you could be talking to a man and telling him, do you know what's happening to me? Do you know what they're doing to me? And he would sit there and listen drink tea, sometimes you'd hear him eating a bit of a sandwich, it was hilarious, and he'd listen. And as he was listening, behind the scenes, people were, 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 were digging up numbers and were demanding a response, an official response from the relevant department. Now, I can't do that. I'm not Jerry Ryan or Howard Stern or any of these people. I can't do that. So what do we do? What do we do when we hear stories like the story we heard yesterday? Do we go on social media and do we put little sad faces and say, oh, it's terrible, what a hero that woman is, and then go back to her fucking sandwiches? Or do we do something about it? What can we do about it? I was talking to Sharon today. and One of the most difficult things to deal with when you're a producer is cliches and unworkable solutions like common law. Now I'm not having a go at David Shaler or anybody else who's been on this programme. I love these people and I will listen to them all day long. But common law is as useful as shitting in your hat. It's useless. Common law is no good to Sharon Gale. The Magna Carta is no fucking good to Sharon Gale. Because you have a situation where these people, with the backing of the police, have basically ended democracy. They've said, right, you can't report on family court stories. You can't speak about them. If you do, if you break or breach the gagging order, you're going to be done for it. Right? The guest, the interviewee, could go to prison and the person making the radio program could be fined. What are you going to do in court? Say, uh, I assert my rights under the uh, Magna Carta, under common law. They're going to laugh in your face. Do you know what he's going to do? He's going to bang, or she, you sexist bastard. They're going to bang their gavel and they're going to say, Next, please. Take him away. Oh, let's all start using the Bradbury Pound. Fuck off with that nonsense. It's no good. Let's all join a Facebook group. Or better still, some truther is coming to town and he's going he's gonna to be here for three days with all his truther pals. Let's go and spend £400 with him at his audiovisual or alternative whatever conference and let's just sit there and talk about how shit it all is. Let's do that. 
Eh, that's no good either. That's no good to Sharon Gale. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Do you have any answers? At Richie Allen Show on Twitter. Any ideas? Any answers? And don't get annoyed. Don't get wound up. Don't have a progressive scream because I criticised the Bradbury fucking pound or the truth or conferences because they're no good. They're no good. These women still don't have their children. Haha, Richie. Touche. Well, what's the point in your programme? Good question. That's a fucking good question, that. What is the point of speaking to people like Sharon Gale? Is it to massage my ego? Oh, he's lovely, Rich. Oh, he's lovely. What a presenter. He's lovely. Listening to that woman, he's lovely. That's bollocks. That's bollocks. That's narcissistic bollocks. What are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about people like that lady? And the others. And the tens of thousands of others. Are we going to find these people in our communities? Are we going to go with them to these places, these courts? Are we going to are we going to offer them comfort, support? Are we going to get involved with them in trying to raise awareness of this in terms of trying to get some journalist or some politician somewhere or some barrister somewhere to have the balls to take this on? Are we going to do that or are we going to go well, I paid two quid a month to the Richie Allen Show. I've done my bit. I shared the interview on Twitter. I've done my bit. It's out of my hands now. What are we going to do? These are the uncomfortable questions. That lady's on the south coast. Emma Ibbitson and Pete Middleton are in Yorkshire. Their child was taken away solely and only because they, as filmmakers as professional filmmakers contracted by a local or, or by a company to do a road taste a road safety video had the temerity to include their child in the road safety video. This is how they came to lose their child. This is no joke. What are we going to do about it? Say it's shit? It's terrible? Or are we going to... Are we going to do... Are we going to get up off our arses? Because when it all comes down to it, and I've said this to great friends of mine over the years, what I'm going to say now is no dig at anybody in particular. Because I know some of you out there, you're not supposed to say out there, by the way. If you ever make a radio program, don't say out there. There is no out there. But some of you ascribe to new age mysticism, to new age philosophy. So you're not going to like what I'm going to say now. Infinite love is the only answer, is the greatest load of monumental bollocks that was ever spoken by anybody. Take your two hands, shit in the left one and fill the other one with infinite love and see which one gets full the fastest. Infinite love, eh? Sitting around talking about the way to deal with all this is for us all to, to reach some higher level of consciousness is even more monumental bollocks. It is fucking bollocks. And I'm sorry for swearing. I said I wouldn't. This maddens me. Infinite love. That's new age debunked crap. Because it gets you nowhere. The only answer is massive non-violent civil disobedience. And the longest journey begins with a single step. Therefore, people in their own communities have to say, I'm not taking this anymore. How could that materialise? Well, if Sharon Gale's neighbours could give an arse about what's happened to her, they might collectively say, we're not going to pay council tax anymore. Not five of us, not ten of us, not twenty of us, but a thousand of us. A thousand. We're not going to pay council tax. Which would cost the local authority the best part of... A million quid. The average bill being about £1,200 a year. 1,000 times 1,200 is at 1 1.2 million. A thousand people say, I tell you what, we're not going to, uh, we're not paying anymore. Why are you not paying? We'll send the bailiffs around. You can send who you fucking like around. This woman's child has been kidnapped. And let me tell you why. 
She was kidnapped because this woman, this woman's daughter was wrongfully killed in the custody of the medical authorities back in 2001 and she had the, she had the, she had the temerity to ask for answers. She's been harassed, she's been victimised by a tyrannical state, therefore you can stick your council tax up your arse. Does anybody give a shit though? And I'm talking about me too, I'm no angel. Right? I do for me, and I did for me, two years ago when the local authorities started screaming at me for money and sending bailiffs, I told him to fuck off. You might remember the phone calls. I played them on this programme where I threatened... I put myself in a little bit of jeopardy by doing it. I told these people on the telephone, if you come around to my house, I will fucking kill you. You will not harass me for a debt I don't owe. Now, I knew they couldn't attempt to enter the property illegally. I knew that it was all a load of bollocks. What these people do is they harass, 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 harass until people get tired of it and give them money. I knew this, so it was easy for me to say, Go away. If you knock at the door again, I'm setting the dog on you. Private property. You're not welcome here. So they fucked off, right? What about doing that for other people? What about doing it for other people? For people who need that assistance? For people who who can't do it by themselves? Who's going to do it? Sky News ran a report two weeks ago and they said, uh, you know, 60% of people in the UK have no idea who the person is living next door to them. Have no idea what their names are. (laughs) What Jesus Christ, you know. Where's that going to get us? Longest journey starts with a single step. Somebody will inevitably say, Richie, back in 2003, a million people, now if you think about it, that's a very good point. A million people went to London and said, not in our name, you are not going to bomb Iraq and murder Hundreds of thousands of people based on a pack of lies, you're not going to do it. And people will say, you know what, Rich? The government went ahead and did it anyway. The government did it. What's the point, Richie? It's a waste of time, right? Well, the, the big problem with that is those one million people, the biggest mistake they made is they went home. Why did they go home? Why didn't the million people walk to the gates of Downing Street and say... We're not leaving until that slimy, miserable bastard Tony Blair and his wife and the Chancellor and all the rest of them vacate the premises and go to another country. We're not leaving. Neil Haig, the artist who's illustrated David's books over the years and done a great job illustrating them. Neil said to me in London some years ago, He said, this would all be over tomorrow, Richie, if a couple of hundred thousand people went to Westminster, stood there and said, we ain't going anywhere. And he said, forget about the Occupy movement, which was infiltrated anyway. It was much ado about nothing. If a million people, if if, if a hundred, if two hundred thousand people from all walks of life said, we've had enough. We've had enough of murdering, lying, child abusing tyrants. selling every state asset in the country through the banks of the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers and the Warburgs, impoverishing the people of this country, selling out jobs, making people homeless. We've had enough of it, you know. Not to mention, of course, bombing people into oblivion overseas. We've had a fucking enough because they have no mandate to do that. And Neil Haig said, a couple of hundred thousand rich came over. Game over. Then you get people saying, well, who's going to lead that? Who, who's going to lead that? Does there need to be a leader? Can't people come together and say, going on the occasional NHS march, getting our sandwiches, getting a bus down to London and then coming back up, it ain't working. The tyrants laugh their arses off. Doesn't get covered by the BBC. Who lies? 2,000 people turned up today to march with the teachers. In fact, it was more like 50,000. But why let 48,000 get in the way of a good lie? So the media won't cover it. 
Teachers go and have their say. NHS workers go and have their say. Steel workers go and have their say. The miners went and had their say, but they went home. They went home. What if somebody, what if people didn't go home? Through three and a half years of this program, people who'd never heard programs like this before have learned that we are effectively being driven, humanity is being driven off a cliff by Rothschild Zionist controlled maniacs, mass murderers, who every day of the week oversee the slaughter of people in the Middle East, in Central America, and in other places you never heard of. Everything that's valuable in the country in our countries, they sell off, as I said earlier on, to these institutions, through these institutions. They fraudulently loan people money to buy houses and rig the fucking game to the degree that they know that these people will run into mortgage difficulties, these people do, and then they take their houses off them and they sell them to vulture funds. Did you give them a mandate to do that when you went and voted for them? Are you still are you still so fucking sick that you believe that Jeremy Corbyn is the answer? Really? Bernie Sanders. They'd have put a stop to it, wouldn't they? Or can you accept that the time for trusting some guy wearing a rosette and saying vote for me is long gone? that to stop these people doing what they do, you've got to be prepared for massive non-violent civil disobedience. But the massive part is is not the most difficult thing. Massive comes inevitably. It just takes people to take a couple of steps. But people prefer to assuage their con- their their conscious their, their consciences by donating to criminal schemes dreamed up by the likes of Ken O'Keefe, the most vile, racist scumbag that ever walked the face of the earth. That's what they'd rather do. I'd rather give my money to Ken, even though I know he's a fraud, because at least I can then lie to myself and say, "Well, I've done my bit." No, you've not not done your bit. I've not done my bit. Putting people on programmes, it's not enough. We're trying to get Sharon Gale's story picked up by a national newspaper. Now the national newspapers have picked up one or two stories from this programme over the last few years. Not many, but one or two. And there's a chance. There's a slight chance. Maybe. Just maybe. Somebody will pick it up. And they'll run with it. And maybe something will come out of it. But there's also a very good chance that nobody will do anything with it. So what are we going to do then? Oh well. Well I I gave her the airtime. Made me look good. I'm great. Jerry Ryan. Marvellous. I'll just move on to the next one. Or can we actually do something about it? Tweet at Richie Allen Show. That's at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. Base Ninja tweets. People are literally waiting for the revolution to be televised. A question I ask myself every day. What can I do? I think many just think that I've lost my mind. Any protest we know would be infiltrated, he says. Then kickoffs would start... And those kickoffs would end peaceful protests. The kickoffs would be the kickoffs would be instigated by enemies of the people, by agents of the deep state. Now that's a very strong possibility. Gail tweets that infinite love, I think that's what she's referring to, is not monumental bollocks. Or else who the feck am I talking to from other fecking frequencies? And she says, I'm not schizo either. I have seen a 
uh, psychiatrist. Free Spirit says, the infinite love is a David Icke saying, infinite, lo- infinite love is the only truth. Truth, everything else is a lie. That, that's right, but I'm not referring to David. David says, infinite love is the only truth. I'm talking about people who say, infinite love is the only answer. That's a new age thing. Make daisy chains and use cool terms like namaste and put a dot in the centre of your fucking forehead and hug a tree. See where that gets you. It's not David I'm having a go at and if I wanted to have a go at David Icke I'd have a go at David Icke. It's not him at all. Infinite love is the only answer. Love, ultimately it's love is the only answer. As you get, you keep getting told all you need is love. What a load of bollocks. That didn't do much for four million people in Vietnam, did it? All you need is love. Da, 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 da. Anybody seen the napalm? Didn't do any good at all, did it? People getting into VW vans and driving to San Francisco. What the fuck did that do? Nothing. Millions of people were killed in Vietnam. Millions more were killed in Central America in the 70s and 80s. While people were singing, all you need is love. And imagine. Beautiful songs. Wonderful songs. But they don't mean anything. And saying that love will end war is bollocks. Because the entities that are doing the things we've been talking about on this programme for years, they're impervious to it. What are you going to do? Stick your chest out at them. All together now, bombard them with love. Oh, I'll tell you what, don't send any more weapons to Saudi Arabia to bomb the living shit out of the Yemenis with. Why? I don't know. I, I just feel full of love all of a sudden. Right? Faisal tweets, real law and order broke down some time ago. The authority served criminal masters. The word needs to be spread and the media are an enemy rather than an ally. The, the media are more than an enemy. I, I used the phrase last year, you're talking about the media, you're talking about a clear and present danger to your safety, to your health and to your well-being. That is what the media is. It's gone beyond collusion. What the media is doing. Listen to today's coverage of the lies about the Russian spy poisoning. Free Spirit tweets, let's go on the streets, thousands of us. So the police and army can shoot us until they run out of bullets. What a pack of bollocks. Now I know where the saying mad Irish comes from. Free spirit. Fair enough. What's your solution, free spirit? Say namaste. Go to a trucer conference. Is it? Get offended when one of your trucer heroes is criticised. Or just... Chat about how awful it is, what's happening to Sharon Gale, and then get up tomorrow, rinse and repeat. Is that your solution to it? You see, I'm putting words in your mouth because you haven't offered a solution. You never heard of Gandhi, no? Never heard of Gandhi. You really believe that if hundreds of thousands of people were to uh, descend on Westminster, you actually believe that they're going to start opening fire on people. Really? Don't think they would myself, to be honest. I think it's more likely, as others have tweeted, that infiltrators would try to disrupt things and to cause incidences of violence, to try and disperse people, and and maybe some people would be beaten. Yeah, okay, maybe some people would be shot. Maybe some people would be. But hundreds of thousands... Do you think they're going to shoot hundreds of thousands of people? If you thought that they wouldn't shoot hundreds of thousands of people, but some people might die, do you think it's worth the risk for future generations of people that you stood up to it? It's worth the risk that you might just get shot? No, I'm no hero. I wouldn't like to get shot. If I saw stormtroopers running at me with the latest space age hardware guns I think I'd probably shit myself I think I might make wee wee but I think I can say despite making wee wee I might actually have the balls to say well fuck it I'm going to stand here anyway 
Don't know. You know, by the way, I'm not pissed off, by the way. People say, oh, you're pissed. I'm not pissed off. I'm asking for answers. What are the answers? And some people don't like me running down the cliched answers. All you need is love. Bollocks. The Bradbury Pound. Bollocks. Right. Common law. Utter bollocks. Oh, that's a... Common law, there's no greater bollocks than that. But it's true. What difference does it make? Common law in a court of law, surrounded by the type of judges and the type of witnesses that have destroyed the lives of Sharon Gale and her ex-husband and their families. What are they going to... Oh, right, right. Oh, I see, yeah, you've got a document there that says common law. Oh, Christ. We just wasted hundreds of thousands of pounds prosecuting you. We're sorry. Off you go. Here's a lollipop. Fuck off, you know. Come on. Common law. Ken O'Keefe. A contract. A contract to end war. Non-payment of taxes. Yeah. Put that criminal in prison. You have to give Ken O'Keefe a hundred bucks to not pay taxes. If you want to not pay taxes, just don't pay taxes. But you'll go to prison for that. Of course, if lots of people did it, and I mean a lot of people did it, well then, it becomes more difficult for the establishment to say, oh, you're all going to prison. <clears throat> but you don't have to pay Ken the vile, racist, Jew-hating O'Keefe. You can do that yourself. Like I said, if a thousand people on the south coast who know about Sharon Gale, if they said, tell you what, we ain't paying council tax, that's a kick in the teeth of 1.2 million quid. There you go. We'll send the bailiffs around. I couldn't give a shit. We'll just keep the windows closed. Give that lady her baby back. And then we might consider paying council tax again, which is a fraudulent tax anyway. Non-payment of council tax is not a criminal matter, by the way, it's a civil matter. Non-payment of income tax is a criminal matter and will see you in prison if they find you guilty of it. But again, if enough people said, fuck him, not paying, not filing a return this year. Why? Because they're mad, because they're psychopaths, they're murderers, they're criminals, they're vile, they're, they're in league with Lucifer, whatever, whatever you want to say, I'm not paying them. Oh, we'll never get to that. Well, every journey begins with a single step. So whether you like it or not, and I don't, I don't say it to hurt you or to put you down or to mock you or to ridicule you because I don't have any more intelligence than you. But I've been around long enough. All you need is love. Truth or conferences. Common law, common purpose, whatever you want to call it, it's monumental bollocks. Because those solutions depend on the compliance of the tyrants that you're fighting to defeat to begin with. Right? Good luck with that. Show me where somebody has gone into court and has walked out using common law. And don't give me some shitty YouTube video where some guy is making statements he can't back up. Give me evidence. I want to see evidence, proper evidence. I want to see the transcripts from the court. I want to see the transcripts. But I won't see them because they don't, they, they don't exist. Until people are prepared to do things, whether it's random acts of kindness for people who have been assaulted by and had their rights stripped by the state until we're prepared to physically stand with them and not give them a a cyber pat on the shoulder. Oh, I'm really sorry to hear what happened to you on the Richie Allen show. Unless you're prepared to do a little bit more than that, it's never gonna it's never gonna stop. And that's how I feel about it. I feel very strongly about it. Faisal reminds us, this was Gandhi's miracle. 
He managed to lead an organised and disciplined effort to throw off a military occupation. And there were only a couple of hundred casualties in that conflict due to the effectiveness of his tactics and the discipline that he inspired. That is true. It can work. Donna Devane. Donna, welcome back to the show. Nice to know you're listening. If that pie in the sky spirituality religion worked, we wouldn't be in this global mess. It's all part of the mind control network. Susan Suzanne Campbell says, just watching here, Richie, what can we do? Well, I've given a suggestion, Susan, whether it's workable or not, whether people are prepared to entertain it as an idea or not. And there are men and women who turn up at family courts and they're not necessarily blood relatives of the victims of these scandals. They are people who just find out about it and they have the humanity and the decency to go and stand alongside people like Sharon Gale. So imagine if there were several hundred thousand non-violent Violence is never the answer. Can't win anyway. That's not the reason it's not the answer. It's not the answer for far deeper reasons than you can't beat them. But violence is never the answer. Don't be killing any of these people. Don't be threatening to kill any of these people. Beat these people by saying, I refuse to cooperate with you. But we need to be legion. Like I said, forget the gurus. Come to my conference. Forget these people. No need for any money to be involved here. No need for any money. Just the willingness to say, today I'm going to London and I'm not coming back until these tyrants vacate the premises and vacate the country. It's a fucking pipe dream, Richie, I hear you say. It might well be. But you know what? As a solution, as wild-eyed and as hairy-brained as it might, might, might sound, it's got more going for it than all you need is love. We've got to elevate our consciousness. Use common law. Let's use the Bradbury Pound. Let's say that's the end of the programme and... Um, I'm going to love you and leave you. Thanks for spending time with me this evening. And if you don't like what I said, look, you've got right of reply. You can email me, you can tweet me. I'll read your tweets out. I don't care. It's how I feel. And I, I think we're going to have to do more with information given to us by people like Sharon Gale. What we are doing with it is is useless. And that's how I feel about that.